Okay, so we're now recording. If you'd be good enough to start off by just giving us a little introduction. Yes, I'm Hal Plotkin, Senior Policy Advisor here in the Office of the Undersecretary, U.S. Department of Education. That's great. Um, and we were just talking a little bit about some of the stuff that you're interested in at the mm -hmm. moment. Do you want to start off there? Sure. Um, well, on the research side of, of OER, um, I, I'd love to, to uh, share with you uh, my sense of how important it is and uh, and more specifically the kinds of research that I think would most move the field because when um, I had the recent conversation with Barbara Chow and others at Hewlett uh, one of the things that we were discussing is you know they can't make investments in everything so what are the most strategic investments that they could make and there are these little tipping points where certain things cry out to be done and one of the big conversations of course that's taking place here in the United States and around the world um, uh, as people become aware of open educational resources, uh, are the cost savings involved. But at the end of the day, it's very obvious, uh, to me at least, and I think to many others, that um, that's kind of the tail wagging the dog, and that the most important question is what contributes the most to the quality of teaching and learning. If, if OER is cheaper, who cares? Uh, if it doesn't improve the quality of teaching and learning, and if it does improve the quality of teaching and learning, then the then the different cost structure is an added benefit that that is very important, but by itself is not determinative, and certainly not determinative of public policy. So I've been drawn to, and I'd be curious what you make of this. I, I wanted to. I know you have eleven hypotheses. I have one of my own, and I wanted to share it with you and see if it fits and meshes with yours, and um, and maybe it'll be useful. Um, but. Uh, but the preface is the research that uh, the scholar Linda Darling Hammond has done. Uh, she's a professor of uh, education at Stanford University. And she did a seminar not long ago for us where she looked at the four highest performing school districts on the international PISA exams. And we all know the international PISA exams are an imperfect measure of learning, as are any assessments. But still, they rough, they're a rough benchmark and approximation. And what was fascinating about her uh, seminar on this and she actually brought together two Washington representatives of the four highest performing school districts that are consistently higher performing than others on these international uh, K-12 assessments. And each of them uh, got up to do a little presentation. They were from all over the world uh, with very little contact with each other. Singapore, um, a, a province in Canada, Finland, I forget where the fourth one was. Um, and uh, But by the time the fourth one got up to talk about how they had achieved these consistently um, superior results on this international assessment. You knew what they were going to say, because the first three had essentially sketched out independently the uh, architecture of their educational programs, and there was a striking similarity. And the thing that, that jumped out at me, and this is in Professor Hammond's uh, paper on this, which I can share with you, was that in all of these cases, the instructors themselves were deeply involved in the construction of their learning materials and assessments. There was no case, now in some of the cases they were using commercial uh, materials, but in all of these cases they were, um, uh, they were constructing in an active way both their, their learning uh, materials and their assessments. In no cases were any of the school districts using uh, pre-baked learning materials that somebody dropped out of a helicopter on them and they were teaching, you know, staying one chapter ahead. And and so I've been mulling this over for a long time and then finally it dawned on me, and here's the a analogy I've been using in my talks um, on the topic, which is, um, would you want to go to a restaurant where all of the food was pre-cooked someplace else and then warmed up and served to you right before you, you ate it? Or similarly, would you want your child to attend a culinary academy, or would you want to attend a culinary academy, where what they taught you was how to warm up food that somebody else had prepared? And of course you wouldn't. So it finally came to me in the shower the other day, ah, it's the same thing with warmed over learning materials. That somehow across borders and across cultures, uh, students can intuit if their instructor is has enmeshed herself or himself in the construction of the curriculum and the learning materials, and that the very process that an instructor goes through in order to um, construct something, to cook something up fresh, uh, 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 makes them a more credible um, and um, impactful instructor than someone who is essentially warming up a lesson that somebody else created. And so then it dawned on me that, you know, that's one of the real primary benefits of open educational resources, is that they 
um, more so than proprietary resources, are ingredients on a shelf that invite an instructor to get engaged and, and become a maker of learning experiences. Um, and that what we really need, I suggested to the Hewlett Foundation, is we need to tease out the differential impact on the quality of teaching and learning of open educational resources as opposed to more conventional approaches. Because ultimately that's going to be the data point that uh, provides the tipping point uh, in terms of wide-scale adoption and support and uh, participation, particularly by public agencies. So that was what I was asking the Hewlett Foundation to fund um, and uh, or suggesting it would be a very useful contribution to the literature and to the uh, 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 and to the science, the cognitive sciences that we're trying to understand here is what impact does open educational resources have on the quality of instruction? What impact does it have on retaining and motivating teachers um, and keeping the best of them uh, in the career? What impact does open educational resources have ultimately <clears throat> on um, uh, 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 learning objectives and on progression through courses and programs? And I think that um, uh, we're long past the point in the OER movement where we need to focus on the fact that, hey, you know, there's this thing called the internet, and the cost of the uh, marginal cost of distribution of a intellectual work is crashed to near zero, and that the distribution methodologies that we had for analog learning materials is now, you know, as antiquated as the horse and buggy was. You know, I think that's well understood. Now to get it over the hump, uh, where it becomes uh, closer to the educational mainstream where, where its impact could be truly transformative. Um, we need uh, to figure out what are the well-structured studies and research designs that help us make the case that um, using OER helps instructors become more effective, it helps them become more credible in the eyes of their students, and it has an almost osmotic effect uh, that's independent of disciplines um, that, uh, that a as a general rule um, raises the quality bar in, in education. So that's the kind of research that I've been looking for and that I've been trying to convince others um, to conduct in as rigorous a way as possible. I don't know how that fits in with your interests and the direction or your hypotheses, but that's the, that's the slice of it that, that I can see most clearly. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I think we are quite close to that. Um, and we do have hypotheses that are around these kind of things. If, if maybe not in specifically the way that you phrased it. Can I just ask you what you were saying about um, credibility? Because this is not one of our hypotheses, the idea that through using OER, teachers become more credible in the eyes of their students. Um, is that something that you've uh, sort of seen yourself mm -hmm. before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that was, that's part of my aha in the shower moment. I mean, I don't, I don't have the uh, empirical base that I can cite for this, but I'm I got to thinking as I, as I was trying to put together the results of Professor Darling Hammond's study and the rigorous look she took at these four school districts and the striking similarities between the way that they presented their methodologies. And, um, and then I got to thinking just about, you know, what that means in terms of the experience that a student would have in a classroom. And, and, and yes, it just seems on the face of it, just abundantly clear to me that if an instructor walks into a classroom and says, here's the lesson I prepared for you, um, and I selected this for this reason, and I modified this for that reason, and I'm, th that the instructor is, is naturally closer to the material, cares more about it, has more passion for it, and in, and in education and pedagogy, we know that the charisma of an instructor or the passion of an instructor or their ability to connect with a student um, uh, uh, plays a large factor in how the student responds to the instructor, and that um, uh, and that students respond to instructors uh, better when they trust them. I had a great moment when I was uh, chairman of the board of trustees of the Foothill De Anza Community College District in Silicon Valley before um, joining the Obama administration. And as you may know, our community college district passed the first policy in the in the U.S that made the um, uh, production of learning materials that reside in the public domain. That tells you how far back it goes. This is before the terms open educational resources were coined. 
but we made the production and continuous improvement of learning materials that reside in the public domain an official purpose of our college system and, uh, and instructed our chancellor to report back to our board of trustees every year on the progress that she was making in supporting instructors who wanted to either create or use open educational resources. And one day, uh, at a board of trustees meeting, a math instructor who I would, had never met, two very large campuses, 45,000 students, very difficult to even know all the professors. And so a math professor I had never met came to the board of trustees and, and waited patiently to talk with us till the oral communications part of the agenda when he was able to address the board freely. And he said, look, I just want to thank you um, for passing your policy on public domain learning materials. Um, he said, um, because it's done an amazing thing. Uh, it's increased the degree of trust that my students have in me. Because they know now that rather than sending them to the bookstore to buy some proprietary learning material that somebody else cooked up that in many cases is overpriced, they know I've made an extra effort to specifically find for them the materials that are most suited to what they need to study um, and that I'm providing it to them at a near zero price point, which they appreciate. And he said, as a result of that, my students trust me more. And he said, I want to... I want you to know, you may not realize this, but that in education, the coin of the realm between an instructor and a student is trust. And that if the student doesn't trust the instructor, the, the learning is hampered. And that when that trust relationship is established, the learning flows more freely and the class is more collegial. And he said, these, couple, these last two years, where I've been encouraged to use open educational resources, I have student after student coming up to, to me and thanking me and volunteering to do extra work. And it's very, very clear that, they, that, that the policy that you've put in place has increased the trust relationship between the students and the instructors. And this was unsolicited. This was, you know, this is anecdotal. Um, but this is an instructor who took time out of his schedule late on a, you know, 9 o'clock on a Monday night to come meet the Board of Trustees simply to say thank you um, and to explain what impact it was having. So I think that, that, that this issue of how students react to instructors who have gone to the trouble to personalize and customize learning resources based on their needs and then provide those learning resources at a lower price point, which is particularly important for U.S. community college students, um, that they've created an, an environment which is more conducive to learning um, in a way that a, a traditional approach with proprietary materials can't, uh, can't replicate, or at least can't replicate in a consistent and reliable way. And so I think for me, these are insights that represent my own sort of peeling of the uh, OER onion several layers further down than I had ever got to before. But, but, but because I can now see that, I realize that that is the, um, that could well be, if, it's, if, if that insight is correct and can be established in a, a methodologically sound way, um, uh, that that could very well make the case for OER uh, as bulletproof as any uh, social policy intervention can be made. And we have the ability to prove that case. We haven't done it yet. But, but, but I have a hypothesis that I would so like to be tested because I think if it can be verified, uh, it would be an extraordinary tipping point in the international discussion about uh, pedagogy, proprietary, and open. Well, uh, one of our um, sort of methods in the project is to... Uh, receive suggestions for hypotheses and then look at testing them. So that's definitely something that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. um, let me. So, how long ago was was this stuff going on at Foothills De Anza? Um, let's see. Uh, early two thousand. Early two thousand. Yeah. So you've been on quite a journey with OER. It's fair to say. Yes. Um, yeah. Since the early days, maybe. Um, well, I was used to call them public domain learning. Whatever, yeah, whatever they were called so, back then. Yes, I was, uh, I was in this fight before we named it. Mm. And I helped um, uh, in the early days of Creative Commons, of course, because one of the things that was necessary to make the dream of public domain learning materials real was um, uh, intellectual property licenses and a new uh, sort of legal infrastructure to support uh, the development of the field. So I wrote the first uh, 
article that was ever published about the idea for Creative Commons before the organization existed, um, and as uh, some of us were uh, uh, organizing the effort to try and generate the support it needed to stand it up. And so how have things changed since then? Um, uh, I think we've finally caught the public's imagination. I think we've been through several different tipping points. Um, I was involved with the group that developed the Cape Town Declaration on Open Educational Resources, and you know that was, I think, a seminal moment for the field. I represented the United. The, I had the the honor of representing the Obama administration and the United States government um, as the formal delegate to the UNESCO World Congress on Open Educational Resources last year, or maybe two years ago now, where we passed the UNESCO Declaration on Open Educational Resources. And I'm active with um, a group that's working with the OECD, uh, which just put 150,000 euros in their program of work and budget to study the impact of uh, OER um, uh, at the suggestion of the U.S. delegation. Um, so there have been a lot of um, changes and a, and a lot of progress. It's, it's accelerating rapidly. Of course, the, the waters have gotten muddied recently with the rise of the MOOCs and um, obscurity. One of the great things that's happened um, is uh, uh, that we've won the messaging war. And, and I think that's a very significant thing. And by that, what I mean by that is probably for the te first 10 years I was involved in this movement, um, I was called into debate after debate about whether you could get to quality through open. And there were all of these heated claims on the other side that open was synonymous with chaos and um, uh, misleading information and unvetted information and, and, uh, 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 and that you could not reliably get to quality in a universe where, where um, there wasn't um, somebody who had the uh, intellectual licenses or the intellectual property locked down and controlled and tightly vetted. Um, and that you could only get to quality through a proprietary environment where, you know, somebody had a process and a procedure. And it's, it's, it's the old uh, debate. I don't know if you read, ever read Eric Raymond's seminal book, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Fa fabulous book. E Eric's a computer programmer who may more than anybody else be responsible for the fact that we all have interoperable email, which he built as an open source product. I have heard of that book. Yeah. Bizarre as in a market. Right. Yeah. Right. And and he contests the two sort of development models in, in um, uh, software development, the open source and the proprietary closed source model, likening one to a cathedral, somebody building a cathedral, and it's, you know, there's very a plan. Lots of and it's planning very, and takes years to kind of There's together, one architect yeah. and everything like that. And a bazaar, where, you know, in the, in the sense of sort of the Arab bazaar, the souk or something like that. And where it's a much more freewheeling atmosphere. And he coined the phrase that um, uh, uh, with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. You know, that in a cathedral, if there's something wrong in the plans, they just keep building the building until afterwards everybody looks and see that the thing falls over. But in a bizarre kind of atmosphere, you know, uh, it's more uh, freewheeling. So this debate went on for about 10 years. Sometime in the last two years or so, we reached a tipping point where now you have a lot of folks who are essentially proprietary vendors of one sort or another, but who have adopted the open nomenclature. I liken it to what we called greenwashing, which it was a, something that uh, still happens, but it was particularly uh, problematic in the early days of the global environmental movement, where um, uh, essentially polluters realized that green was popular with consumers, and so you had you know, the coal industry repackaging itself as clean coal. And, you know, all kinds of, um, uh, I was actually a litigant in a case against the General Electric Corporation when they put out um, uh, incandescent light bulbs, but called them green light bulbs. Uh, and they copied the packaging of the actual energy efficient light bulbs manufactured by a smaller company to try and sort of uh, convince, the, fool the public, basically, uh, that they were um, a green sheep, but they were actually the wolf in the green sheep. We're seeing the same thing, I think, happening in the muddying of the use of the word open, uh, particularly with reference to massive open online courses. They're not using the phrase in the way OU UK uses them or in the way Creative Commons uses them. Um, but it represents a sort of capitulation on the messaging side. Because now, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not arguing that you can't get to quality through open. They're now saying, well, we're not really closed. 
um, when, if you examine the nuts and bolts of, of what those of us who have been involved in the open movement for longer are concerned with, um, you know, then very often they don't um, comply with any of those practices uh, or procedures. So that complicates our mission, as it complicated the environmental movement's mission as well. Um, uh, the good news is we won the messaging war. The bad news is we now have to figure out um, some new methodologies to create essentially good housekeeping seals so that people, institutions, and others aren't misled by sort of false marketing claims that are designed to build user bases but that really don't um, enable the kind of uh, flexibility or reusability or opportunities for continuous improvement that are at the heart of what we think of when we're trying to develop uh, open educational structures. And one of the um, claims that MOOC providers will make is that they're improving access to education. Do you think that being open improves access? Um, uh, undoubtedly, it, the evidence is still pretty spotty whether it improves throughput or completion. But, but sure, you know, if you open up the door, then more people can walk through. How well served they are uh, once they walk through that door is a, um, is a question that's, that still, you know, begs to be, hasn't been a answered and it really begs to be asked. But it's, but it's a first step uh, in uh, um, democratizing uh, access to education is simply making it possible uh, for people to access high quality instruction. But um, to make it effective, we need all kinds of uh, scaffolding and and other support systems and more coherent um, uh, integration of programs and, and um, uh, some ability to reliably certify the learning and, and uh, ass assessments that are more widely uh, accepted and as uh, valid and robust. So there's, so it's a step along the path, but by itself, it's necessary to be open is necessary to improve access to education, but it's not sufficient. It seems to me there's a tension between the kind of very sort of heavily individualized uh, OER that we were talking about before where uh, a teacher can try and customize something for a particular cohort of students and the idea of, for example, a statewide curriculum that has to be followed and, and met uh, and effectively reduces the flexibility that's, that's there because, well, this is what you have to teach. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see that? Do you think there's a tension there between those two things? Uh, is there any, an easy way out of that? Yeah. Well, this is something I'm really interested in. We're spending a lot of time working on now. Um, and we're trying to figure out uh, what constructive role uh, our administration can play in encouraging the development of what we call next generation uh, flight simulator-like open assessments. Um, and you're smiling, so you probably know exactly what I'm talking about because I think it's a... I think it's a kind of a thought train that a lot of people are on and it leads us all to a common destination. And for us, that destination is, is thinking about the flight simulator model of, uh, of educational assessment, you know, and, and by that, just in a nutshell, you know, our, our U.S. military, uh, before they'll give a pilot, a new pilot, the keys to a $300 million aircraft, they'll put her in one of these simulators and, the, and they'll, you know, one of the wings falls off in one episode or the engine doesn't work or there's a big storm or there's all these. And if she navigates the planes to a successful landing on the aircraft carrier enough times under all of these adverse circumstances, um, then they give her the keys to the plane. They don't give her a bubble test, you know. Um, fill in the blanks, things like that. They have to, she has to demonstrate an ability to do it. The wonderful thing about flight simulators, though, is there's no way to cheat. There's no need to store answers or to rotate test banks or any of that kind of stuff. It doesn't make any difference if I watch you do the flight simulator right in front of me. Um, that's not going to make me more able to uh, overcome the challenges that are thrown at me when I sit in it. And and so our current thinking is that the way to bridge the divide that you just identified and to accelerate progress is if we can uh, play a constructive role in the development of some open next generation flight simulator like assessments that are focused in specific disciplines, um, some that jump out as being obvious or, you know, are you college ready in mathematics or not? Um, uh, do you need what we hear in the United States sometimes called bonehead English, you know, or can you take college-level English classes? Uh, 
Are you, uh, and you can see how you could develop these flight simulator-like assessments um, that would be open, that would have embedded in them random number generators and random scenario generators and things like that, so no two would be exactly the same when they're served, but they could become very reliable uh, indicators of proficiency uh, and competence in a wide variety of fields. It's easier to see how they apply uh, in technical and STEM fields, but that's a fine universe to begin with. Um, and then once we had those assessments, if we had an open flight simulator-like assessment that certified uh, competency, say, in organic chemistry, uh, then uh, the educational service providers could compete uh, with their programs in terms of how quickly they can bring student groups to proficiency on those open assessments. And that that would be a leapfrog advance for the educational system, which right now is still operating under this sort of black box model of assessment, where um, I don't know what to teach, or I don't even as a student know what to study, um, because I don't know what's going to be in the test. And the, and the goal of the instructor is to hide the test, you know, and keep that, keep that secret and we can't, and we have to hide the answers too. I, I went to a recent meeting of uh, some folks who are getting a, a, a billion dollars in grants from the U.S. federal government to develop next generation curriculum, and they had all of these meetings about the elaborate technical methodologies that they were going to use to hide test banks and to hide test scores, and and it and and to, and then they have to rotate the test banks and they rotate the the uh, the answers. Oh, what if the students find the answers? Everybody will cheat. And so now we have. Well, if you took just 10% of the money that they're spending trying to create all of these little three-card Monty hide the learning objective schemes, and instead invested it into developing uh, next generation flight simulator-like assessments that would be open and free for everybody to use and that everybody would look at and say, whoa, he scored a 97 five times a row in the physics thing. You know, that's, this is somebody we're ready to put into graduate school. Um, uh, that that would that that would just be a quantum step for um, uh, the ability to match uh, programs um, and to streamline programs so that they achieve the, the learning objectives. So that's the lo very long-winded answer, but that's the that's the opportunity that I see right in front of us to take a very big next step. That's really interesting. Do you think that? Um, students themselves would, would feel motivated by these forms of assessment. Yes, yeah, and I and I see it happening in my own daughter's life. I have uh, I don't know if you have kids. You have, no. right. So I have an eight year old. Yeah, have you ever hear the game Stacking States? Right, I haven't. So I'll just give you this in a nutshell, just because it's a great model, and I get I I, I probably have sold more copies of this game than anybody in the country, and I have no stake in it. Um, my my daughter discovered it on her iPhone, but um, this is a game that kids play, um, and it's a very simple game. They play it on their iPhones, or more on our family, on their parents' iPhones, um, or on their Android phones. Um, and what happens is the game asks the student a question about geography. It focuses on, you know, we have 50 states, and each state has a state capital. And so it, it focuses on um, what is the capital of the different states. And the student is asked a question and given a little hint. And if they get it right, if they guess the right capital, then they get a little, on the screen appears a tiny little icon that's shaped in the, sh that's, that's in the shape of the state that they just guessed. And it kind of floats down to the bottom of the screen um, where it perches there. And as the student accumulates these states, she has to stack them in a way that they hold together. And the only way to stack the 50 states properly so that they do hold together is to assemble them in their proper order in which they appear on the map. Um, and if you don't stack them properly within a certain period of time, then the states fall off the bottom of the screen and, and a little sound comes up and you have to earn that state again. Um, well, the kids love this game. Um, our daughter, you know, would play it every moment that she can. Uh, and the result of it is that by the time she was seven years old, she could tell you every state capital in every state and the contiguous borders of every state. You know, what borders Idaho? And she'll tell you. You know, what are, what are the states that are on the border of Nebraska? I guarantee you, you approach 30 adults on the top floor of the Department of Education and throw those questions at them. And my daughter will outscore any one of them um, because she's 
uh, she's intrinsically attracted to the game and loves the game, and the the learning was internalized in a way where she's not even conscious of it. Um, uh, so for me, that was another aha moment because I realized, my goodness, this is a you know this is an approach that would work in you know if you can do this with uh, states and state capitals and seven year olds, you can do it with chemistry and valences and you can do it with the periodic table of the elements and you can do it with you know chemical reactions and you can do it with uh, 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 you know DNA advanced DNA sciences and um, all of that works ahead of us you know um, but every bit of it is going to um, make learning more accessible and um, uh, and effective in in such dramatic ways and that's why I come back to this research question that I raised with you earlier about our need to demonstrate the positive impact of open educational resources uh, on teaching and learning, because as these new resources are developed, I want to see them developed in open formats where the world's population has access to them, because what a shame it would be if the digital technologies that make these new uh, advances possible uh, end up getting walled off behind proprietary paywalls where, uh, you know, only the 5% of the world's population who currently benefit from formal systems of education have access to them. And that would be, you know, a historic catastrophe. And so that's the, you know, both the opportunity and the peril that I see coming, which is, you know, that, that it's very clear we have th these new capacities within reach. Um, and Will we have the research that will guide public agencies in making sure that they are supported by the public sector in ways that make them uh, universally accessible? And with that in mind, um, how do you see the situation with open access to journal papers and data and that kind of thing? Um, we have debates going on in the UK. I'm sure you have similar debates here about uh, whether or not commercial entities have a role to play um, and what that role might be, whether we should be going down the road of an entirely open at the point of use system, free at the point of use. If so, who's paying for that? How do you make it sustainable? How do you see the issues around open access? Well, they're very complicated, um, it, um, but, but one element is very simple. Um, and I'm really proud to be associated with um, colleagues in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, who were directly responsible for the publication of the open access directive that was issued uh, by the White House G about two months ago now, uh, which instructed all federal agencies to put in, put in place new practices that would ensure that within 12 months of publication of any federally funded data, uh, that those resources would be made available openly and in machine-readable formats to the public. As, as a sort of basic matter of philosophy, I have, I'm, I'm long since on record, going back many, many years, uh, that the public ought to have access, that if the public pays for it, they ought to own it, and they ought to have uh, uh, easy access to whatever they pay for. Uh, that leaves room open for any number of commercial providers to come in and um, add value to that data, um, customize it in some ways, build on it in ways that that uh, uh, enable profitability. Well, remix it, essentially. And remix it, yeah, and all the rest. Uh, you know, uh, of course, this is a challenge to the, to the uh, legacy business models of many academic publishers, and they fight tenaciously to maintain those uh, processes. But yes and, yes and no, one of the more amusing things that happened in my position here, there's a very major American uh, academic publisher uh, and one of their vice presidents came in early in uh, President Obama's first term to talk with me because my views on this were fairly well known by then and, and there was some alarm about where we might be moving and, and he was all full of threats and bluster about, you know, how they would shut us down in Congress and how, uh, you know, we ought to negotiate with them rather than uh, other political players in Washington because, you know, they're... Uh, they're the incumbent industry, and we had an obligation to protect their interests, and blah, blah, blah. And, and basically, he treated me as if I was somebody with horns on. And it was a cordial but not pleasant meeting, and it didn't end very well. Well, not 10 days later, another vice president from that very same company, uh, but this was the vice president of Innovation and New Markets, 
And that vice president came in to talk with me, and he just wanted to say how brilliant he thought I was, and how wonderful these opportunities we were that were creating all of these next generation opportunities, and they had all of these ideas and plans about how they're going to build new uh, products and services around all of the open data and open educational resources that we were making, to, and keep it up. And I said to him, do you ever talk to your other vice president? You know, the one that was in here a week ago threatening to chop off my head. And uh, I said, oh, no, you know, it's a big company. We don't really have it. So I, don't, I think the publishing community itself, and particularly the legacy academic publishing, is very divided as they're, you know, simultaneously trying to figure out how to adapt to a rapidly changing world and, uh, and, and how to protect, you know, profit margins. Uh, I think at the bottom, at the, at the end of the day, these trends are inexorable, though, and even if the Obama administration decided, which we haven't and wouldn't, but even if we decided that our primary goal was to protect the profit structures of existing legacy commercial publishers, and even if we threw everything we had to try and achieve that goal, we wouldn't be successful. Um, because there's just a sort of a, uh, you know, the arrow of time and technological progress um, that we can't protect their place in the marketplace, you know, any more than President Coolidge could have protected the horse and buggy association from the onslaught of trains and automobiles. Because their business model is based on sort of scarcity of information. Yeah, yeah. And and based on the, the, the distribution chain, uh, antiquated, just, you know, that envision you know, warehouses and shipping facilities and, and, you know, a whole sort of cost structure um, uh, and a very sharp division between producers and consumers um, that is evaporating and in many places already has evaporated. Mm. So um, I, I, I don't envy them. I wouldn't want to be the president of a major commercial scientific publisher right now. I think that would be a very challenging position. But, but you know, uh, heck, I'm uh, 56 years old and I was for almost 25 years a business and economic correspondent for a variety of newspapers, magazines, media outlets and things. And in my, you know, short life, I saw a variety of industries wax and lean and, and um, you know, that at one point everybody thought uh, uh, were a sort of a stable part of life. I remember mean, my, my father, who's long since passed away, uh, told me that one of his first jobs was delivering ice for all of the um, ice boxes, you know? And there was a whole industry of people who would ship ice from the Arctic hinterlands and drag the big icebergs down and they would chop it up and they had and then they had trucks that would deliver. And there were ice boxes that were made to accommodate the ice that would all that, you know, time marches on. Uh, those things are in the museum now. And um, should the government have had an interest in preserving ice boxes? I mean, it's the same, it's the same kind of goofy um, requests that are made of us. That, that, gee, even if we tried to do that, it, it wouldn't really work. So, um, you know, we're pretty clear here, um, at least on most of our good days, that this is the Department of Education. It's not the Department of Publishers with an antiquated business model, and. You know, they may need one of those departments, but that's not the Department of Education. And we're pretty focused on trying to figure out how do we maximize the impact of public expenditures uh, on improving the quality uh, and, and teaching, uh, of teaching and learning and its widespread availability. But, you know, these are contentious issues. And in a free capitalistic society, all kinds of uh, every, every interest has an equal right to uh, express their preferences and try and exert their will and you know over time the best ideas win um, Let me ask you about the same uh, open access issue, but from the point of view of uh, a researcher or a teacher an academic um, One of the things I've found and I'm a philosopher by training and I know a lot of people who are sort of trying to break into tenure as a philosopher with varying degrees of success as you might expect um, there aren't that many jobs to go around, and it's quite competitive. Now, if you ask them, why don't you publish your stuff on an open access basis, the worry that they have is that it will be, it will be perceived as inferior to the stuff that's in the well-established high-impact journals and that kind of thing. Um, and I've been asking a few people this, this question uh, during my time here. 
What advice would you give to somebody like that who's not really sure whether being open will be to their advantage or not, basically? Um, is there some way to convince them, do you think? Well, I can, I can only share my own experience, <clears throat> which is, you know, right when um, it became, uh, when Dreamweaver came out, I don't you know, Dreamweaver was one of the first um, uh, tools for creating websites that a mere mortal could uh, um, operate with just, you know, one or two classes in HTML. Um, uh, I decided, I have about 650 publications um, uh, from my career as a writer and, and journalist, most of which I, I retain ownership rights to. And um, and I was forever going through my file cabinet as I had a new research question. I'm trying to remember, who was that person I talked to that I needed to talk to again? So I decided one day to go ahead, and a lot of my things were digital or had been digitized, and I paid somebody to come in and digitize the rest of them. And I put them all online on my own website, uh, really originally just for my own use. Um, and I put a Creative Commons license on it because at the time we had just started Creative Commons and we wanted to show people how they worked. And so it was a good early exemplar of a, you know, that a, a regular person could put these licenses on. It wasn't that hard. Um, and much to my surprise, uh, all of a sudden, uh, lots of other people started looking up old, you know, they were indexed by the search engines and, and people said, all of a sudden, you know, I went within, I don't know, a few months from, I don't remember, you know, 20 hits a week, which was mostly me, to several thousand. You know, now I, I'm still, I, I'm still, I checked it a couple of weeks ago, I'm getting about 20, 25,000 hits a week uh, to one article or another of, of, uh, of these ones that are on site. Well, um, number one, I went ahead and put Google ads on them, which took about, you know, five minutes. And, um, with some screens in it for things that I didn't want to advertise or thought were inappropriate. Um, I think now, uh, now that it's like 12, 15 years later, I'm probably approaching um, the point where those ads have generated more money than I was paid to produce those articles in the first place, which would have never happened if I had kept them all in my filing cabinet. But more importantly, they are arguably responsible for the fact that I'm here as a presidential appointee. Uh, who the heck is Hal Plotkin? You know, uh, who would have ever known about me or, or my thoughts or ideas, um, many of which I was similarly hesitant uh, to match up against the ideas of other more eminent or better known thinkers or anything like that. But it turned out that there was at least some value in some of them. Um, and I found myself uh, increasingly called up to comment on, you know, matters of the day or uh, educational policy, both nationally and internationally. Um, I think if I had kept everything locked up in the file cabinet, I'd still be in uh, California and I'd still be calling up editors, begging them for assignments and, and trying to do one article after another. Um, and instead, today, even in a very down economy, you know, over the last few years, I've been very, very fortunate, not would, that you know, I can have my pick of professional opportunities. So that's just my own story about, you know, uh, now, yes, I could have put a paywall on my site and given two sentences of each of my articles and then asked everybody to pay me a dollar fifty each before they could look at them, and I never tested that model. Maybe that would have worked out better. I don't know. I, I, don't, have the, I don't have the data on that. But I do know that what I did in terms of uh, sharing um, my publications uh, is not something I would ever think of undoing because it has served me personally very well. I think most, if not, well, it's definitely not all academics but uh, or writers, but most people write to be read. Um, some people just want to be left alone in their library to, you know, yeah. spend their time doing that. Yeah. Um, I love the idea. Well, my <laughs> um, ISP, this is kind of a vanity thing. But my ISP has a, a tool where I can see it's called Most Recent Visitors. And it as pretty close to real time. It'll I can log on to it and I can see who's looking at what on my website in pretty much real time. And I just get a kick out of the fact. Sometimes I'll turn it on and I'll say, oh, look, around the world, I mean, some of them are bots and things like that. But you can usually tell because they, there's a way that they get identified. And I go, look, you know, around the world, 217 people right now are reading something I wrote. There's, a, there's somebody in Tanzania right now reading my article about solar batteries. 
and there's you know somebody in 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 um, the eastern part of Germany who's reading my article about uh, election uh, election technology, and this for me is just of uh, it's not money you know I do okay, but it is on another sort of psychic level very delightful, um, and uh, very motivating you know it it, it um, you can tell because I keep coming back to it because I keep wanting to see, you know, and I'll be crestfallen if I turn it on and at some point, you know, at, at four in the morning or something and there's only 36 people online reading stuff. It's like, where is it? Where where do you all go? And I'll log back in the next day to see if it went back up. So, uh, Given that most people are um, uh, right to be read, do you think that there's an issue in academic culture about recognition, what's valid and what's not valid as an academic mm -hmm. output. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of changes do you think uh, universities, uh, I'm thinking of mainly, um, what kind of changes might they make in terms of how they recognize what an academic does? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I get most excited about, and I, you know, I don't know if this is an extrovert, introvert, or where I fall on the spectrum, but I, um, you know, um, a lot of teachers love to get in front of a classroom and, and interact with students and, and writers and media commentators enjoy the same thing. Um, uh, and in the academic sense, when an academic is brave enough to uh, and generous enough to share their scholarship with the world, you know, I think they ought to be honored and, rec and recognized for that. That was the goal of the po of the groundbreaking policy we passed at the in the Silicon Valley Community College District, the Foothill De Anza Community College District, uh, more than ten years ago now, um, that uh, you know we wanted to set up a structure where uh, what I used to always say was it, in academia it used to be the the motto used to be publish or perish. You probably heard that, and I've been telling people for years that I wanted to supplement that, if not replace it, with a new ethic of uh, organize and thrive, um, and that we ought to give credit to the academics who do the best job of organizing freely available public, uh, uh, public domain or open educational resources in their domain. If you become known as the best steward of open educational resources in your domain, we ought to honor and recognize people for that. And that ought to be considered in tenure promotion, uh, tenure and promotion. Uh, considerations. One of the things we started doing was giving awards to the professors who did the best job of cultivating open learning materials for use by their students. That's every bit as valuable as publishing a, uh, a journal article that appears in a you know a for-profit uh, high-priced journal. Uh, you know, um, and uh, while I always, uh, as a higher education governance official, always steered clear. Of, of, of anything that looked like we were trying to direct academics to do that, what we discovered was when we asked our professors uh, whether they were interested in open educational resources, whether they would like to build open educational resources, whether they'd like to use them in their classes, whether they'd like to continuously improve them consistently, uh, and Professor Joe Harden at uh, University of Michigan has now replicated this study at dozens of colleges and universities across the country. Consistently, more than half of the professors uh, would step forward and say that they either already were doing it or wanted to do it or would like to do more, um, uh, and that their main reason for wanting to do it is it made them uh, better scholars and uh, was helpful to their students. And their main complaint was that in most cases they got little or no support recognition or acknowledgement from their institutions for doing this work, which they often did on their own hours at night or on the weekends, and that was the customary practice. So there's a huge opportunity for uh, uh, the producers and, and improvers of open educational resources to be supported more effectively uh, in the interest of the common good by their host institutions. And I think we're just beginning to see uh, um, some, some movement in that. Um, but but we have lots of room for improvement, and as we do improve, uh, I think the quality of the available materials will increase. That's great. I'm, I'm aware that um, we've been talking for coming up for around 50, 55 minutes. I don't know if you've got any pressure on your time or if we can carry on for a little bit longer. Um, unfortunately, I do. I have um, 
Let's see. I think this room actually is going to be taken over in, okay, then. in about uh, five or ten minutes. Okay, that's that's no problem. Let me just uh, ask. I've got one or two more questions anyway, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask you about um, Creative Commons licensing or open licensing, technically. Um, how important is that, do you think? Well, it's essential. I mean, uh, I was ignorant when we started uh, what I was calling public domain learning materials, um, I didn't know until I met Larry Lessig, uh, who was noodling on the idea with, of Creative Commons at the time, that something we designated as public domain here in the United States could be patented, or copyrighted rather, uh, in other countries. You know, that somebody could pick something up in, in Moscow that was public do and assert an ownership right to it because it wasn't de designated public domain and that the intention of creating public domain learning materials could be thwarted by uneven national intellectual property schemes. So we absolutely needed to create Creative Commons uh, to provide the technical infrastructure that would ensure the, uh, the durability of uh, resources that are produced uh, intended to be for free and public consumption. So it's an it's a, uh, indispensable part of the infrastructure and I'm sure that I will spend uh, the rest of my life, in one way or another, um, uh, uh, supporting that organization as I as I have from the beginning. So one final question then: um, What does the future hold for this administration? Do you think, in terms of education policy, and how does OER fit in with that? Well, time goes by very quickly in a presidential administration, and you know we've only got three years left, and then the new administration is coming in. So um, I think it's clear that, uh, and I'm very proud to have played a role in the fact that our administration has made the largest, the single largest investment uh, in open educational resources in the history of the world, uh, up to $2 billion. We made $2 billion available through something called the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College Career Training Grants. I didn't pick the name, but that was the name that was available that we put money into and we reconfigured that program with a requirement that all of the new, pro newly produced open uh, uh, IP re intellectual property resources be released with a Creative Commons by license. Um, I'm totally convinced that, um, that you know, going forward, that, that this will lead to the greatest expansion in access to high quality educational opportunities in the history of the world. Um, that's a lot to say for a presidential administration, and I think that uh, President Obama and Vice President uh, Biden and Secretary Duncan and the other leaders are going to be very proud of that um, as it becomes more important. It's not as, you know, we're still producing these materials. We've, we've put out a billion dollars. We'll put out another 500 million uh, in the next few months. And then before the end of the second term, we'll put out the final tranche of $500 million. There's a lag time in producing the materials, so the materials that we funded with the first 500 million are only now, within recent months, beginning to come online. So they haven't yet had an impact. Most Americans haven't touched and felt them yet. But uh, I think that by the time my eight-year-old grows up, the use of these resources will be as ubiquitous as the use of the public parks that were built by President Roosevelt's administration during the Great Depression. Nobody knew in 1932 that he was building the Hoover Dam or that uh, they were building all of these great trails in Yosemite and Yellowstone and all of these places that made nature's uh, bounty available to Americans with a, uh, uh, a degree of accessibility that, had, uh, that was previously unknown. People discovered what was built in the 1930s and the, by the 1950s. So we may be in the you know, 2020s or 2030s before you know, everybody's looking around and just taking it for granted that they can learn chemistry at home um, and that they can go to school to improve and perfect their knowledge, but that they can get a pretty good basic uh, education in a variety of fields um, uh, at, at uh, you know, at practically nothing. And, and uh, I think that's, you know, a, a transformation. It also uh, has a larger impact, which is, and I've argued this uh, for years now, um, and I helped our ambassador to UNESCO make this argument not long ago in the in the Guardian newspaper article that he wrote. Um, but 95%, according to the Guardian newspaper, 95% of the world's population presently has no access to high-quality post-secondary studies of any kind. And in that 95% of the world's population, that's where the riches of our generation reside. The 5% of us who have been fortunate enough to have access, we're not going to be able to power 
uh, economic growth or uh, uh, improved economic demand uh, in a way that restores global economies to uh, traditional post-World War II levels of growth that people find acceptable. Um, the only way that the globe's economy is going to uh, recover and generate sufficient demand to employ the unemployed and to uh, absorb the uh, excess labor is um, by helping the, you know, when somebody's illiterate and, and dirt poor, uh, they can't trade, they can't produce, they can't consume, um, uh, they can't buy a book if they can't read. And, and it's by extending educational opportunity to the vast majority of humanity that the rest of the developed world is going to find its economic footing again. So this is not, a, um, this is not an act of charity. This is uh, uh, an act of uh, survival uh, for the human species. Either we uh, do a better job of developing the capacities and talents of the people who have their noses pressed to the glass but can't participate, um, or we doom the rest of us to a perpetual cycle of decline and decay. So, um, you know, this is ultimately education is about uh, freedom and economic development and the ability to translate liberty into an improved quality of life. And, and that's the, you know, that's, that's the path that I think open educational resources puts us on, and that's why the work that you're doing is is so extraordinarily vital, because without this solid research base that's empirical and um, uh, and robust, uh, we will we'll be stuck in this tired debate um, about proprietary versus open and. Uh, and how these, uh, and, and whether or not it makes sense to integrate these approaches into formal systems of education, you know, we could be stuck in that debate for another 10 or 15 years. Good research could accelerate that progress by decades. And, and so I don't think there's anything going on in the field that's more important. That's at least what I told the folks at Hewlett and, um, and why I'm and delighted <laughs> to know that, uh, that they're making these investments. Yeah. Well, um, that's really great. And um, thanks so much for your time. I'm going to sure. stop the recording now. Of course. Because um, I don't want to...